Hey, we're live. Welcome to the green room for Disrupt TV. Today we've got a special co-host, Liz Miller. Welcome to the show. Hosted for Bala. <laughs> and we've got our producer, L, and three amazing guests. Uh, we're going to quickly introduce each of our guests, ask them where they're coming in from in reverse order, and of course, uh, what they're talking about today. So kicking it off, Rebecca, where are you coming in from? What are we talking about? What one of three cities are you at? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ray. I'm so excited to be here. I'm coming from Miami, Florida today. I live between Miami, San Francisco, and London, but joining you from a very sunny and wonderful Miami today. And we're here to talk about my new book, which launches on February 27th, called Survive, Reset, Thrive. And it's a proven and pragmatic playbook for how especially entrepreneurial leaders can grow their company through any market condition, especially extreme volatility. More important than ever, given how much volatility yeah. we are facing today. Jerry, uh, where are you coming in from? What are we talking about? You've been back. Hey, you're a return guest. I, so. I know. I know. I, I took up too much time last time, so I had to get some extra time in. Uh, thanks for having me back. I am coming in from just outside of Boulder in Colorado, so it's a little bit colder than where you are, Rebecca. <laughs> um, but it's a lovely place to live. I live on 40 acres with four horses and a view of the mountains. And I'm here today mm -hmm. to really talk about uh, my new book, which came out a few months ago, November. It's called Reunion, Leadership and the Longing to Belong. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do in that book is really answer a question, which is in a world that's filled with divisiveness and uh, political attacks, what is a business leader's responsibility to answer the longing to belong? So that's what the book is about. We look forward to it. And of course, Tim, where are you coming in from? I think maybe San Francisco, based on that background. Yeah. Hey, Ray. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm coming to you from Pleasanton, as you said, P-Town in the East Bay. Um, we have, per capita, more parks here, I believe, than anywhere in the United States is what I hear. <laughs> so it's an amazing place. I have three little boys. Uh, they're not so little anymore, unfortunately. Uh, 16, 13, and just turned 12, uh, 13 and, and I'm sorry, 11, just turned 11. And so been out here um, taking them golfing and so on. So it's been a great place out here in the East Bay. So, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm the, the CEO of, of Socratics AI. We're reinventing investment banking using AI. And we believe we can 10x the productivity of deal execution. So that's what we're working on. And so happy to talk about it. Very, very cool. We'll look forward to catching up with you. And of course, Big Town is a great American city. So thanks for there. Okay, with that, hey, turning it back to Elle, let's kick off the show. Let's go for the count. All right. Three, two, one. Everybody, welcome to Disrupt TV. I'm here with my amazing co-host, Liz Miller. She is the guru of CX. She's the whisperer into CMOs. And more importantly, she's here at Constellation Research. And she's about to host one of our biggest events of the year, the Ambient Experience Summit. So welcome to the show, Liz. Oh, thanks for having me. You know, I always jump at a chance when I get to hashtag host for Vala. It just it's, hosting it's, for it's, Vala. it's what I live for. Hosting for Vala, hashtags and fours. <laughs> Everyone knows. If you know, you know. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here because we have amazing guests and some really important lessons. So I'm I'm stoked. 
<laughs> well, hey, thanks for being here. And of course, uh, we are here live on Disrupt TV, episode number 353. And more importantly, we're kicking off the show with Tim Yoon. Tim is the CEO and founder Tim. of AI Banker. And this is awesome. He's a serial founder, operator, and board advisor at, at a number of uh, early stage VC backed companies. And of course, he's been at companies like Aviva, Lincoln Financial, B of A, and AIG executing almost over $7 billion in M&A transactions. And of course, he scaled a uh, number of early stage companies to greater than 20 million in revenue and raised 70 million in venture financing, led 3 billion in public debt and equity financing, and of course, is a Penn State Nittany Lion and Booth alum. And so welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Thanks, Ray, I really appreciate the invite and this is very exciting for me. You guys are, are amazing, so really happy to be on the show. Very, very cool. Well, cool. 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 So, Tim, I'm going to I'm gonna be a little greedy here, Ray. Can I jump in? Am I allowed to start sure, asking similar questions question. now? <laughs> yes. Okay, Tim. I'm super curious because AI banker, it immediately makes me think that, like, a robot's going to take all my money and run down the street. So <laughs> I know that's not what you're doing. I know that's not what you're doing. So what is AI banker and why did you build it? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we've changed the name from AI Banker, which was a very early stage name, but it's it sort of puts you in the right place. We're um, we're called now Socratic's AI based on the Socratic method, and there's an important yeah. reason why. And um, so basically, what happened was I was uh, I just raised about twenty eight million dollars for a Series C embedded software company, and I was the COO, CFO, uh, and helped to scale that company. And, and ultimately, I was like, you know what? Um, I saw the AI revolution coming. We were doing some AI stuff and said, we're going to be, this is going to be a very large wave coming and much like, in fact, I think bigger than mobile. So I want to get out there and do it. And I'm really, what really gets me up in the morning is zero to one. And I'm at a Series C company. I'm like, you know what? This wasn't that exciting for me. I want to kind of move on. So I went out and did my own thing here. I said, went out and started to look for the idea. And, you know, as I've been involved in the startup space as an investor, as well as a board member. And it's very, very hard to have a, a true venture funded company. It's very hard. And so we're looking for the right idea. In the meantime, my wife is like, hey, Tim, you got to go make some money. So I was advising some companies and uh, helping them raise uh, Series A, Seed, and so on. And ultimately what I did was I realized ChatGPT was amazing, as most of you guys know. And what I would have previously had hired a, a, a designer to help me go build the design of deck and so on. But I realized that ChatGPT is a good starting point, whether I could then spit out a, a sort of a, a basic uh, starting point for a pitch deck. Then I use Microsoft uh, PowerPoint designer, which designed the deck for me, right? So I'm like, it wasn't a hundred percent, but it was good enough. And so I, you know, within like 48 hours or so, I had a pretty good first version. Then, and so we went and used it, and the, the, the investor was like, that's awesome. Now, can you build me a financial model? Because this company's been around for a while. And I'm like, brother, I haven't been a financial analyst in 20 years. <laughs> and so they want me to build a full financial model. So I called a bunch of MBA guys. I went to Fiverr. I looked around, and I'm like, there's got to be a chat GPT for financial models somewhere, because this has got to be out there. And there was nothing. And so I called my buddies in banking and private equity and said, guys, help me out here. There's got to be something like, no, what you did 20 years ago in finance is exactly what we do right now. It's all about Excel, PowerPoint, some chat GPT, which we're not allowed to use, but we use anyway, right? And then we build decks and models, and that's what we do. And that's why we pay analysts, you know, $200,000 a year plus bonuses, right? And so I was like, this is ridiculous. He said, Tim, go build it. So I went over to Stanford, met with a very, uh, very knowledgeable person by the name of Dr. Ed Chang, who was one of the first directors of R&D at Google. And he was also brought parallel computing, I believe, into there. And, uh, and so I said, hey, is this possible? Can we do this? And he said, absolutely. You can absolutely do it. And so for the first few months, he sort of guided us around what could be done, what can't be done. And we realized, number one, we could actually create pitch books. We could actually create financial models. And, and we can also create content research and ultimately deal insights and positioning. And I was like, that's unbelievable. So not only can you do the job of an execution junior staff of analysts and associates and VPs, but also helping out managing directors. Then we went and talked about a hundred folks in the industry from private equity, all the guys. And those guys were like, Tim, wait a minute, you can do this. And I'm like, like, yeah, and they're like, we know it's coming, but I didn't realize it was now. And so I said, so then we really went through customer discovery. And the biggest thing I think if you're an early stage thinking about a startup, the biggest thing is don't focus on the solution, focus on the problem. 
So we really focus in on the problem. What is the problem that we're solving? And we and, and one of the thing, first things in building a, a SaaS sales force is you got to know right away who's your technical buyer, right? Who's your financial buyer, and, and who's your strategic buyer at times, right? So realize that technical buyers were two. We had analysts and we had managing directors. Analysts were yeah. like, help me with this grunt work, Tim. I really can do it. I want this. And the managing director was like, that's why I have an analyst. I don't care about that. Help me to get more deals. <laughs> so that's what we developed the product around is how can we quickly do this to help managing directors pitch with, a, with clients much faster and better, with a better message, better connection up front on that meetings. And number two, help analysts to execute on it. And then the, the financial buyer would be the head of banking or the, or the CFO or the COO who would say, I want to cut cost. And we realized after doing about 100 interviews with a lot of folks from all the bulge brackets, the big guys, Goldman and Morgan, all the way down to the small two-man shops, right? that about 70% of execution can be actually over the next 24 months, we can get about 70%. So the way I look at AI is right now, it's about a third AI, LLMs, a third humans, and a third software. And when you combine those three, and if you think it's all LLMs, I think you're going to be sadly mistaken. So that's what we found out, and that's what we're building. We got to do from we know what the business case is. LLMs is not just a wrapper. You have to build the middleware that connects them to and actually execute on it. And that's what we built an amazing team to do that. And that's what we're doing. So I have a lot of lessons that I've learned. And every time I do this, it's brand new. <laughs> and there's no cut and paste. You got to learn it. So I've been learning it like like so I've been doing a lot of learning, and that's what we figured out. You know, Tim, that's actually very cool. Uh, one, one of the hardest parts of this is really the fact that you're operating in massively regulated markets. Some would think mm -hmm. it's hard in a regulated market. Others would think it's easier because all the constraints are in place. What do you think? And, and how's it helping folks navigate that, especially if you're a small shop trying to get past this? Absolutely. So my first 17 years, I was at, I, I served in corporate development, mostly in corporate development, M&A, at large financial institutions. And we were 100% regulated uh, at banks at working, uh, so basically the bank capital structure, the Basel stuff. Next, the insurance companies are governed by the state and, and at times the, gov the national, and it's a whole mishmash of regulations. And what you're dealing with here, though, is we said, listen, if we're starting off, really, when you look at the, at the curve of sort of the, the, the bell curve of who you're getting at your song, right? Your first basic customers. If you look at the data, it's about two and a half percent of innovators, and about 13 and a half percent, which are early adopters, right? And the rest of the market, they're not really going to want you. So you really got to work with that group. And that's really the smaller guys, right? And that's what you want to learn. And really the product isn't selling a product. It's the quick learning. And so the, those guys want to give me a credit card, right? They're not regulated. They're more advisors and they're FINRA regulated, so on. But really, we're not really providing financial advice in the traditional sense of the client. We're providing tools, and workflow tools, productivity tools to them. And then they take that and then they translate it over. And then that's where their, their, their tags come in, right? Their driver's licenses come in, the FINRA and the, all of the, the other tags. And so we're providing them workflow tools to do that. And over the longer run, I think, is there are questions at that point. But at this point, we're just going to provide workflow tools makes a lot of sense. So as a leader and as a, as a serial entrepreneur, I mean, you are excited about this stuff. Like it was funny, like you're talking about like, oh, here's what I was doing in the past. Here's what I'm doing now. I'm creating all these crazy markets. I'm going to go do all this stuff. Like you, you're really passionate about this. I love that. But like, so what inspires you to make these big choices? Like what inspires you to create something like this and to take a leap and to kind of leap forward in this type of innovation? So, so the original idea that I had came from, number one, my pain of raising money. But then I immediately said, look, this LLM of things makes it super easy for small businesses, right, to be able to do a lot of this, right? And, and my mom and dad, they were doctors and, theory, and nurses. Right. Yeah, theory. So my, my mom and dad, when they came here from, uh, from Korea, we immigrated from Korea, by the way, through Israel, lived in Israel for five years, and then came wow. here. Uh, there's a story behind that, by the way. Very interesting story. I grew up in Bethlehem, Israel, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Pennsylvania is where I grew up. But I grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for six years of my life when I was very little. In fact, that, I consider that my hometown, by the way. There's a story behind that. But ultimately, I saw my mother and father, who were professionals, came in, in the United States trying to make a life for themselves. They came with not a lot of money because they were missionary doctors. They basically had given up all their wealthy goats, serve uh, 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 you know, sort of serve the folks there. And um, ultimately they worked at a dry cleaner. 
Korean is dry cleaners. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, and, and Tim, I it's that, okay. I'm half Korean. I get it. I just, that meeting was like, oh, like he's going liquor store or dry cleaner. I just, I understand. Absolutely. I absolutely. understand. Yes. Those were the two choices. And my dad was a pastor, so we couldn't do the liquor store. So it was default. We did <laughs> we did like the, we have the same family. My mom, my mom came from Korea as a nurse, and our whole family are Methodist ministers. Tim, yes. are we related? Do I not know something? Well, I'm a Presbyterian, so I'm half Scottish. Oh, I'm half Irish. Okay, we got to stop this. No more on this episode. <laughs> but I want to know so, where in Bethlehem, PA, because I grew up in Allentown. So, <laughs> oh, so so I grew up outside Philadelphia in in, in uh, Montgomery County, uh, which is right in the northeast of Philadelphia. That's where I grew up. So I'm a Phillies fan, a Flyers fan, an Eagles fan. So don't come at me, you 49ers guys. I live here, <laughs> but hey, you'll see me wearing my Eagles gear. So. <laughs> Very, but very I've been cool. very quiet for the last last ninety days. I've been super Sorry. quiet. I just keep it on the on the down low. So, uh, <laughs> but to going back to the story, I saw that my mother and father came here could not speak very, uh, English very well, and they were working as basically manual labor, right, doing dry cleaning and seamstressing and so on. And they always thought about, can I get a bank loan here? But I don't know how to do it. Um, how do I grow my business? If I had one more se seamstress, could I? Do they had no tools to do that, right? And it was me being head of corporate development, m and being an MBA guy. If I was like, I wish I was there to advise my mom and dad to get the bank loan, increase the business, scale. I'm an MBA, right? Scale the business. They had no idea. But I thought if there was a tool that, because LM can use different language in Korean, say, can I fill out a credit application and then help me walk me through how I build a, a business deck and a business case for? Because I know the business, right? But I don't know what this means. Walk me through it through templates and so on. I'm like, wouldn't that be awesome? And sort of leveling the playing field, right? And really empowering immigrants and folks at the end of the, at the bottom here of, of the economic ladder to move up the ladder by providing them knowledge without having to know how to do a financial model, without having to know key statistics, as the liquidity ratios and so on that you learn in business school, right? How can I help that? So that was a real idea. Realized that that was very hard from a fundraising, from a So what we did was, what's the next best thing? If I could help bankers who sit between millions of companies and millions of investors, and there's about 3,000 investment bankers on PitchBook that are under 20 professionals and less, so they work with small companies. If I can empower them to move faster, quicker, better, I can get them on the platform and help them to quickly go remove the friction and help them raise money. And I think that's the big idea, right? And so the idea that is over time, what those people then who are on the platform is a collaboration platform we're kind of building as well, is where they see it and the investors see it and then, huh, I don't need that much marketing money because they're now saying the power of it. They're saying, why don't I use it? And so instead of going straight to the corporate fp arc, which is what Runway and Mosaic and all these guys raising billions, tens of millions of dollars doing that, we want to focus on a very narrow stretch and use that to leverage out. No, it makes a lot of sense. Who's behind it? Who's okay. backing it? Who's your investors? Wow. <laughs> were you on the fundraising? Yeah, so right now we're, we just started the fundraise, and we're getting a lot of traction. Um, and and I'll tell you what, I've been I've been uh, bankrolling, been fortunate to be able, being able to bankroll this thing myself. And I have amazing found, like for example, I have a guy, uh, I have a, a guy in Salt Lake City who worked at one of the largest uh, fintech companies, designer. He bought the vision immediately, and like Tim, how do I help? So he's working full time job, two full time jobs right now, and he's an amazing product designer, product head. I get this guy in the UK who's on, now this is the power of LinkedIn and networks, right? He's a top 10 financial modeler in the world and a great AI uh, pricing uh, a software developer. Amazing, one of the 10 Xer. he's on the team. I get a guy who's a former friend of mine who's a 35. So all of this to say I have a great team. And one of the things I will advise, if you're thinking about starting a company, you better be a heck of a recruiter. Forget the finance, forget the, pro really, you are a recruiter because you can't do it all yourself. Be a great recruiter. That's what I've learned. And I believe, and I think back, I've done all the deals and everything. You know what? I've realized my, 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 my desire and what I love to do is to build a team and help my team succeed. And I serve them. And that's how you succeed in the startup world. Awesome. Awesome. Any advice that you'd have heading into 2024? Someone's out there sitting there thinking, I'm <laughs> going to go jump off this cliff and start a company. I got I'm do a, I start just up. like Tim. I'm gonna start an AI startup because no one else is doing that right now. See Tim, what's 15. your advice for them? So I will tell you, there is a formula, right? And it's not what people think. 
Uh, and I highly suggest if you are a person who's never done it before, don't go in blind. And by the way, just FYI, we saw mobile right? hit that wave. We saw the internet, the mobile. This AI thing is bigger than both of them, right? Because it will be embedded as well in everything that we do. Like as NFX said, AI is water, right? It's not the product, it's water. It'll be in everything, right? And it'll all make the thousands of things 1%, 5% better. And so if you're thinking about, I have an AI product, first of all, think about what problem are you solving? Focus in on the problem. Number two, join an accelerator. Seriously, join an accelerator. They'll give you the frameworks to think about that you don't make the same mistakes that everyone else makes all the time. And they'll give you the sense of thinking about, and the one thing I think is very important that I've learned is your product is really your business model. It's not your product. Right? It's your business model. Because why would a VC invest in a product without a business model that's scalable? Number one. Number two, your focus is on quick learning. It's not upon revenue. And if someone tells you revenue, I understand where the VCs are coming from, but it's about quick learning and building hypotheses and learning quickly. If you don't do that, you're going to fall flat. Even if you get a little bit of traction, you're going you're to fall flat. It's about setting a bunch of hypotheses, de-risking by setting up hypotheses, following a plan of de-risking. And that's the important thing. And also, just the one last thing I I want to do a little sound bite because I'm gonna I'm gonna take some of this and put it on my Twitter. <laughs> as, a, as a good friend of mine said, you know what? When a VC invests you pre-product market fit, you know what it is? It's tuition. <laughs> it's tuition. <laughs> They're paying for your tuition. And if post-product market fit is actually growth and execution, but pre-product market fit, they're paying your tuition. So know Love exactly it. what you're getting. It is pre-seed. That's where you're at. Wish you good luck yep. on the raise. It, oh, yeah, absolutely. So we're on the raise right now. We have a lot of interest from a lot of folks, and they want to see the big picture. And so we are taking our time because it's important to have the right investors. I've been on the boards with the wrong investors. We want the right investors more than the right check. Well, here with Tim Yoon, Socratics AI founder and CEO. Look forward to hearing more about you in the next coming months. So thanks a lot for joining absolutely. the show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Very, very cool. So hey, wow! I think Tim uh, and I are related. I, I'm just gonna, I'm I just gonna say it. I think you're related. Like, I have to go check like, down. Oh, my dad's a doctor. <laughs> my mom's a nurse, and we're. I'm like. <laughs> so, Jerry, are we related about, too? And I'm just gonna figure we this. Out. We're all related. Sure That's the core of Jerry message. So yes, yes. Um, uh, by awesome. way of Italy and Ireland and Korea and Israel and Pennsylvania. So. <laughs> oh, well, see, hey. I'm I. I know, I know. You I got, got my to camera to do it. I don't, I, uh, I, God, I gotta find that off button. So. <laughs> well, here, yeah, circles are really small, but welcome back. We've got Jerry Colonna, author of Reunion. This is a new book, Leadership and the Longing to Belong. <laughs> and as you know, he's a leading executive coach. And of course, he's an XVC and he's been helping entrepreneurs for quite some time. He's also co founder and CEO of Reboot and it's an executive coaching and leadership development company. Maybe Tim will give you a call afterwards. And of course, um, you've written a few books <laughs> Reunion, Leadership, and the Longing to Belong. This is a Harper Business book that came out last year Reboot, Leadership, and the Art of Growing Up, which is Harper Business as well in 2019. I think they're my publisher at the moment. He draws on his wide experiences to keep clients. To, uh, help clients design a more conscious life, and of course, make needed changes to their career to improve their performance and satisfaction. So you've been with JP Morgan Partners, the PE firm, part, private equity part, and of course, Flatiron Partners, uh, which you launched in 1996 with legendary partner, Fred Wilson. And of course, more importantly, uh, you live in a wonderful place in Longmont, Clara, Longmont, Colorado, near Boulder. So hey, welcome to the show. I want to hear more about the book and of course, uh, some of the lessons that are there. Well, thanks for having me on the show. And then listening to the introduction makes me realize how freaking old I am. So no, uh, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Um, it's all here. It's all here. You be young you know, yeah. Yeah. So it's following so Tim, I, I just want to say there is no AI in my book. There is nothing about AI. I don't, I yeah, I get it all. Anyway, it just reminds me of 1996 and the internet all over again. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What would be helpful to talk through right now? Well, I, I got a question for you. So I was super interested in your book. And when I was kind of going through a lot of the synopsis or going through a lot of the material, the titles keep sticking out to me, right? All right. Reunion, leadership, and the longing to belong. Right. right. And, and you don't often, or at least I, I'm making my own admission. I don't right. necessarily think of leadership 
as kind of a idea of belonging. Because I think sometimes when you think of leadership, now right. you want to be as a leader, it right. almost feels like you're separating yourself from the people that you're leading. Mm. Sometimes there's a lot of, you know, thought and grist and, you know, angst around that. So explain, maybe, maybe we can start with the concept of reunion. What is this process? What is the intended right. outcome? And right. maybe we start there. Well, let's start one step back. Okay. Right. One of the most important um, assertions that I made in my first book, Reboot, is that the subtitle of Reboot is Leadership and the, and the Art of Growing Up. And one of the most important assertions, I'm going to sit up because my back is hurting. One of the most important assertions is the notion that better humans make better leaders. And that's a kind of, well, duh, of course. Oh, yeah. Right. But one of the challenges of being a better human is that it requires us to grow up. It requires us to confront the demons of our past. It requires us to really come to understand why is it that we do what we do? Why? So that we can then be conscious about the choices that we make. So that's an important assertion. In exploring that, one of the other assertions I made was that so much of our own childhood was really shaped by the pursuit of three things, love, safety, and belonging. We want to love and be loved. We want to feel safe emotionally, spiritually, existentially. And we want to know down to our bones that we belong. And then 2020 hit. And the thing about 2020, aside from everything that was going on in the world, here we were, I was locked on the farm with my wife, you know, my children who are all adults were out in the world at large. And my daughter in particular was out in the streets protesting for Black Lives Matter. And the thing that hit me hard was here I was four years talking about better humans making better leaders. And what I was not really doing was wondering about what responsibility a better human has to create love, safety, and belonging for the people around them. So reunion, this book is an attempt to explore that question. How can we, those of us who have power, either because of the meat bags, look, I have a meat sack. I look a particular way, I am a particular way. That comes with power and privilege. What responsibility comes along with that? to worry about making sure you, Liz, or you, Ray, feel loved, safe, and that you belong. And I argue it's actually the ultimate responsibility of those of us who hold power to really create that sense of belonging in our community. I'll pause let's there. Take a couple steps. Let's take a couple steps behind that, right? Uh, you, you use a process called radical self-inquiry to get there. Let's talk That's about right. how you do that. What is that radical self-inquiry? And, and, and how does one go through that process? Because that's the heart of you getting to the conclusion that you came to about you know, where that's you right. can give other people agency. That's a great question. So radical self-inquiry is just a term I coined about 15, 18 years ago to try to describe what it is that I do in this way that I am as a coach. And it's a process by which we strip away the kind of mass and stories we tell ourselves about ourselves so that we can really be with who we really are. So what do I mean by that? A very core question of radical self-inquiry, a favorite question now, because it bounces all around the internet, it's like got its own meme, is how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? How have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want. Complicit, not responsible. Okay, how have I helped it along? So a good example is I feel exhausted at the end of every workday. I feel totally depleted and I just don't like. So why do you stay in the job? What do you do that actually helps create those conditions? And more mm. importantly, how does it benefit you? So that's a good example of what I try to encourage clients to do, which is to unpack what it is that's going on inside of them. 
The reason for doing that is to make conscious choices about how they want to live, how they want to lead, what is the culture that they want to create, say, in their organizations. That's radical self-inquiry. Do, do you find that that process of taking those looks and having, because that's, that's a hard question when you when amen you it's it, a really hard like, question <laughs> like when you said it like my whole face like it was like Boom. a sucked lemon right i was like oh i don't like i don't want to go I'm there super, mm, like yeah oh no 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 because i think human right. nature would also then take at least for me personally to a place where i'd start feeling guilty about some of those things well, and i think great, it's really a, easy to get to that so how do that, you get beyond that Right. I love your I love your reaction, Liz. You're absolutely right. And what I often say is the purpose of this question is not to induce the heat-seeking missile of guilt. It is not to make you feel worse. It's to induce curiosity so that you can then be an adult. See how it links back to reboot? So that you can be yeah. an adult and not just be in reactive mode constantly and all the time. So that you can then make choices about how you want to live your life and how you want to lead. And, yeah. and, and overcome the tendency towards toxicity or the tendency towards blaming your staff for the conditions of the workplace. Mm. Is it also, because I think another reaction I, I often see in these types of conversations that demand self-reflection right. um, is almost a defensiveness, right? Where yeah. people will say, you know, I think you see it in like the big social issues, but you also see it in small team dynamics of, hey, this didn't really go right. And all of a sudden everyone's like, whoa, 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 I didn't do it. You know, hey, you set me up to that. There's guilt, but then there's also that defensiveness. Do you also find that being able to kind of have that adult where this, you know, it's almost a statement of fact as opposed to a statement of feeling, that that helps get back to that center of rebooting and being able to come back to that group yeah. dynamic? You know, Liz, you, you form that as a question, but the truth is you're making an observation. And that observation is one I completely agree with right? The first reaction is guilt. The second reaction is a defensiveness, mm. okay? And here's the truth. If we go back to this, the context of the world that we're living in right now, now I'm going to say something that's really hard and dramatic. We're living in a world where mass shootings are normalized. Like, just take that in. Now, the truth is, I don't want anybody on this call, anybody who's listening to this show, or watching this show, to, unless they are literally responsible, to feel guilty or responsible about a shooting or about the fact that gun violence is the number one cause of death of children in the United States under, under 17 years old, okay? Or that we have an anti, a rise of anti-immigration, a rise of racism. I don't want them to feel guilty. I want them to feel empowered. I want them to lean into that question with curiosity mm. and to say, what can I do to make a difference in a world where it feels like we're constantly at each other's throats? And I know it's not your responsibility. See, I'm speaking to the defensiveness. There's a quote from the Talmud that I use to open chapter seven of Reunion. And the quote goes like this. It is not yours to complete the work, but neither you at liberty to ignore the work. We are not responsible for having created these conditions, but some of us, especially people who look like me, can benefit from the conditions in the world we say we do not want to see. I have so agency. Can... Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to ask you about the, uh, you know, the, the theory of uh, American exceptionalism. And you're talking about how it's taking root in society and in schools and in the workplace. Uh, how do you see that taking that root or taking root in the workplace? And, and why is that at the moment? Well, I think that there's a, there's a myth. There's a mythology around this notion of American exceptionalism. We are and have been perceived 
a city upon the hill. Go back to the Puritans. And I love the aspirational nature of that. I am so deeply grateful for all that this country has and does. But when we allow that myth to obscure the reality that, as Langston Hughes wrote in a beautiful poem, America has never been America to some of us. This is also the country that interned Japanese Americans. This is also a country that wrote the Chinese Exclusionary Act. This is also a country that questions the validity and the citizenship status of someone who doesn't look like the majority population or even the perception of the majority population. And while that may be true uh, in the past, right? Have we not learned from that? Have we not had the self-reflection? Have we not advanced beyond that? I mean, unlike other countries, I mean, if you go around the world, would you say that in other countries, they have the same thing? People discriminate sometimes by color or by region or by language. Language. It is it it is true that this is a human tendency. This is true. And there are aspects of this tendency that the United States has overcome. That is true. And it is equally true that there is a rise in anti-immigration feeling in the United States right now, that there is a linkage between anti-Black and anti-Asian racism. This is true. And just because we have made progress. Yeah. A lot of things yes, can be true. Lot, I, mean, I, pulled, that's right. I pulled a lot of folks in New York City and, and I asked someone, uh, I was a, a bunch of taxi drivers, asked people on the mm -hmm. street and I said, hey, you know, how do you feel about the current state of immigration? And the difference is really in illegal immigration versus people who waited in line, followed the rules in immigration. There's a backlash against illegal immigration among immigrants. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a very I, interesting I, thing. I, I, and, 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 so, and I think that that's I, I think that that is a completely understandable experience. My ancestors uh, arrived legally, but the legal hurdles were much lower where my ancestors arrived. So both things are true, right? And I think you're you're absolutely right. the The opportunity right now is to see a connection between those who want to come here and those who are already here. What is that connection? What is the opportunity? Well, back to your book. Back to your book. How, how do you build that sense of belonging, right? Because there is a divide as to those who are legally here versus those who are illegally here and those who wish that folks would follow that process. Uh, but there's also that natural divide where, I mean, in countries where there's immigration, like the UK or Australia or Canada, right? Uh, right? I mean, that's really driven the growth of those countries versus countries that don't have immigration. People do that's see right. that, that that creates a, creates a group that actually wants something more, works harder, puts more grit into it. Uh, and you can also see countries that are four generations out that don't have immigration or that level of uh, energy or interest. Like or vibrancy. That's right. That's right. Do fade, right. Do fade over time. So how do we create that so, belonging, that sort of unification of all? And, you know, we're saying that at the country level, but, you know, you do that in leadership and at a, at a country, at an organizational level. Where do you bring those together? So there was a, uh, an interesting experience that happened for me after my first book came out. After the first book came out, I went around the world and I gave talks in all these different locations. And it was really powerful. And invariably, people would come up to me after hearing my story and they would read the book, kind of the way, Liz, you were just reacting with Tim and saying, wait, your story is my story, even though it's very, very different. In fact, one day, a few years back, I got two messages, one from the CEO of a major US retailer and the other from a man on death row. And both of them read Reboot wow. and said, your story is my story. Now, I think that there's something really promising in that. That's the well, Jerry, promise of yeah. empathy. Well, well, Jerry, I hope this is being used, right? Because when you think about mergers and acquisitions, that team versus this team, right? When That's you think about right. founders, That's right. right? This group that came in early, like the early group versus the later group versus, oh, God, we brought the MBAs and now we have processes, right? Like you you see those kind of things happen, right? They're cultural. The tribalism. The humanity, That's right. You know, tribalism. That's right. We have tribalism. We like to divide. 
right? I mean, like even in the small island where my parents came from, like they talk about the city and these people from this city are like this and these people from this city do this, right? I mean, we, we right. divide as humans, right? And, and that sense of belonging, like how do we build that culture? So. It's with empathy. It's empathy. Empathy can overcome that sense of tribalism. I'm not taking away the belonging that you might feel by knowing to whom and to where you belong. In fact, by knowing to whom and to where you belong and adding to that an empathetic reaction to what's going on, quite frankly, just what we saw between Liz and Tim. Hey, just like me, just like me. Wasn't that beautiful? Well, that and I'm nuts, so. No. <laughs> no. But, but Tim, it was here's, beautiful. Here's my, Jerry, here's my question because I think, okay, so it's, it's interesting. I think when people hear the word empathy, mm. at least for me, Empathy for a little while there got so overused, right? Mm -hmm. Everything was empathy, 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 empathy. And I think a lot of times people confuse empathy and sympathy right. and make those two words synonymous with yeah. each other when it's not, right? Empathy being that act of really being able to sit in someone else's shoes and try to imagine and envision that experience to understand, to be more open to accepting what those other experiences might be. but I think a lot of times people replace that with sympathy, like, oh, I'm so sorry for you, or oh. And and I think that because people tend to lead with sympathy, when you're trying to get two teams together in a leadership environment, if they're like, oh, you had really tight deadlines, okay, but I had to, it allows you to boomerang back to your existence of where you're rooted in. So can, can, in your experience. Can, yeah, let, let, let me sorry. jump in on that, Liz. Yeah. Um, I would argue, I would expand upon your definition of empathy by saying that there's actually a first step, which is self-awareness, which yeah. is knowing where I am, knowing myself, and then using that as a bridge to understanding and listening to the other person. Because without that self-awareness, you're right, it turns into sympathy. And that sympathy actually creates distance. Right. It actually yeah. pulls people yes. apart. It says, you're different than me, but I care about you. That's a cognitively yeah. dissonant message. Whereas if I say, just as I saw you do with, with Tim, oh, just like me, right? And now from that place, if you worked in partnership, it becomes much more possible to overcome the natural tendency to tribalism. Yeah. Well, if you're reading this book and following us along, we're here with Jerry uh, Colonna, and we're talking about his new book, Author. He's the author of Reunion. And uh, check out the quotes, the poetry that's in there. It's pretty interesting. So much good stuff. <laughs> I'm pretty, uh, pretty impressed. And of course, some of the examples that have come from clients that he's been with. So, Jerry, thank you for being on the show and sharing those insights. Thank I think you we so need much, Jerry. more and more belonging. And so, thanks for being on the show. You can follow J Jerry on X at Jerry, C O L O N N A. And thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, Jerry. Wow. That's a lot of hard stuff. Very powerful lessons, right? Take it from the society level, go it to the organizational my level, head, get it to the company level. My head's been it's crunched. It's, like it's, it's all in there. And now, oh, Rebecca, come and talk to me about something like light and <laughs> cheerful and like not hard to do. Oh, no. Now we're going to talk about thriving. Now, come on. Sorry, Liz. Sorry. We're going to make it as simple as possible, but we've got another feel, challenging yeah, one coming up. Yes. I feel like. Like I need you to help me get through. I, I'm like, I got hard work to do with Jerry. Tim's starting companies left and right. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, you got to help me. You got, you got to help me. There's, come on. We're here with Rebecca, uh, the author. Survive, reset, thrive. Leading breakthrough growth strategies in volatile times, and of course, these are volatile times. So, uh, Rebecca's a background. She's a high growth strategy special, strategy specialist, and of course, CEO, whisper, and executive advisor. She lectures at LBS, London Business School, and faculty at Duke Corporate Executive Education. She's also advisor and faculty at BCG, uh, focused on AI. And climate and sustainability. And she's yeah. also a former fellow of LSE, uh, London School of Economic Center for Economic Performance, and of course, a global keynote speaker and recognized thought leader. She is also the global faculty director of the Active Learning Program with the YPO, Young Presidents Organization, yeah. and of course, 
leads several fintech nice. accelerators and serves on the boards of many high growth companies. When she's not on a plane, she might be found in Miami, the Bay Area yeah. and London. So welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having love me, guys. Yeah. I love it. What a fun way to okay. spend Fridays. Yeah. So as someone who has maybe doom scrolled Instagram in the middle of the night once or twice, and I've had to see way too many hand painted signs that are like thrive. Mm -hmm. I can't anymore with yeah. that. So I need some real talk from you, Rebecca. When you talk about survive, mm -hmm. reset and thrive as a loop. Yeah. As this kind of continuous virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. Walk me through. What is it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think right there, you're at to the crux of the issue, right? So Survive, Reset, Thrive was, you know, written over the last year or two. And of course, a lot of the framework did come out of COVID. And I'll come to that in a minute. But this is not new kind of post-COVID stuff. It's conversations I've been having for over 10 years. And something I really noticed after COVID was we were splashing headlines across conferences, across articles, don't just survive, thrive. You know, you've got to survive to thrive. And that message really frustrated me because it missed the part in the middle, right, is the reset. You know, if you're not reset. prepared to change and adapt to the changing situation, like you won't get to thrive. In fact, you might not even survive. And it's just laziness. We give people the message, just get through it. And then you'll go back to performance again when empirically that's not the case. It's that middle move, which is the power move. And that's why I wrote the book. And the majority of the book is about the reset. It's the hard part, right? You know, change is the hard part. But for those who want to be a Thrive organization, I'm going to walk you through a playbook of what it will take to be one of those. Wow. This is important, right? And because of the level of uncertainty, uh, people often think that uncertainty is a negative. So, but what do leaders do differently when they reframe that understanding of uncertainty and apply that SRT mm -hmm. loop that you talk about? Mm -hmm. I think the word uncertainty itself holds us back, right? And I want the two of you to think about this. Mm. The last time you were at a conference, and I know, Ray, you and I are at conferences all the time, or you're at an event, or you're having a conversation, and the speaker starts about the word uncertainty, there's almost always a word before it that means it's going to be bad, right? We say, hey, how are we yeah. going to manage uncertainty? How are we going to overcome uncertainty? How are we going to get through uncertainty? We are framing our brains that uncertainty right. is negative as something Push we need past. to get through, yeah. right? So the way we even talk about it, uncertainty has become a threat, right? And so the very first thing we have to do is reframe. And you reframe with a definition, right? So what is the definition of uncertainty? Uncertainty is a series of future events which may or may not occur. Whether or not those events are good or bad depends on what you're trying to do and how you're set up. And that's what it lead, takes to lead an organization, right? Figure out what you're trying to do and then get set up. And you've got to constantly reframe, right? Because you're going to be surrounded by other leaders and other organizations and team members who constantly want to place the future as negative. And it's a series of future events which may or may not occur. And there is opportunity in every trend. goes back to our first point, if you're willing to do that reset. No makes a lot of so sense. So when you just, yeah. you, you describe it as a loop. Mm -hmm. Right. That, you know, yeah. you're, but I think a lot of times people think of thriving is like, isn't that the state you want to be in? Like, is yeah, that absolutely, the continuous absolutely. state I want to stay at? Like, I, I want of course, to be Of course, but that's not the real world, right? Just like in our right. personal careers, just like in an organization, we want to be thriving 100% of the time, not reality, right? And everything in growth is a loop, not a line. You know, we have the OODA loop for decision making. You know, we've got the lean startup loop. If you think about the most powerful frameworks that have broken through, life is a loop, not a line, right? And that is what breakthrough growth is like. Now, look, our brains want us to be linear. We say, hey, I go through a checklist and I survive. Sure, I'll go through the steps and reset. I've done that and now I'm just thriving. But you're going to keep facing shocks. The shocks can be external, like a COVID, like a Brexit, like a war, like a recession. Shocks right. can be internal, right? not getting a major investor coming through, losing a major customer. Shocks are internal too, right, Liz and Ray? And then you've got to sometimes go back to survive. But the first way to kind of be this consistent Thrive company is acknowledge we're going to have occasional pause points in that survive phase. Now, what most companies do is they swing between the two. And, you know, construction and real estate are great examples. So all industries do this, right? You know, when interest rates are low and cash is flowing and Ray, you and I know the Bay Area very well, boom, we're spending, we are competing, we are paying more because it's like we've just got to win. And then when things go down, we do layoffs, we cut costs, and we go into recession proofing. Now, here's the thing. If you're constantly swinging between growth times and downtimes, as an organization, what have you built capability in? Neither, 
right? You're not uh, great at stabilization. You're not actually great at thriving. So as an organization, you haven't built the capability to be a consistent growth company. So if you embrace the notion that, hey, markets are going to swing, but our growth pathway doesn't have to, right? We can keep growing through any market condition because we're going to do this proactive stabilization. So Liz, going back to staying and thrive, the first step you have to do is stay there as long as possible is do proactive stabilization. Now, that's not recession proofing. I don't do recession proofing. Yeah. I don't even like to use the R word, right? Because we can grow through anything. But, you know, are you doing the right things in cash flow? Are you kind of looking for customer stickiness and modes? Do you have low fixed costs? In that way, when a shock does hit, you've got less to do than everybody else, mm. right? And so that's well, part of the that middle part's the big thing. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Huh. Well, no, no, but this this actually yeah. is a point that you highlight yeah. in the book, right? The difference between planning and preparing. Yeah. Let's go deeper yeah. there, right? I mean, this preparing is very, yeah. very different than what you're doing, uh, trying to set up for a plan of something that might not even yeah. happen. Absolutely. Look, I have gone as far as someone who talks about strategy, you know, 15, 20 hours a day, Ray, I don't even use the word strategic plan anymore. I don't like to use it, right? Because the word plan <laughs> makes us think this list. must happen, right? Plan makes us think I must put this in place. And when you label your strategy a plan, we have now framed our brains. And again, framing is very critical in all of this. The growth mindset very much comes to this constant reframing. Plan says must make this happen. Right. And the situation around us is going to change. And if you are so fixed on putting the plan in place, you are not being heads up to how things are changing around you. Now, there's some things we still need to plan. Let's go back to construction. You know, you still need a project plan. Right. Let's go back to tech. You're going to have some things where you're planning. But when the past is not a good indicator of the future, when a linear model can't tell us what happens next, you got to go into preparation mode. And one of the biggest switches is going from making decisions based on facts to making decisions based on beliefs. Now, people usually give me a look and they pause when I say that, like, whoa, that's the part I'm uncomfortable with. Like, I was with you until then, but not now. Now, I didn't say you're not using data, did I? I said you're making decisions no. based on beliefs because as the situation around you changes, if as an organization you always wait until something is a fact, there's no strategic insight. Everyone has it. You've got to move ahead. And look, we make decisions based on beliefs all the time. Just most organizations aren't mature enough as a leadership team to articulate those implicit beliefs and say, these are the four or five big bets we're making. Let's go back to our first guess. This really matters in AI, right? Where do you think AI is going to disrupt your industry? How is it going to disrupt your industry? Where are the value creation opportunities now? You've got to line in those beliefs first before you can do anything about integrating it back into your strategy. Interesting. You you talk about power moves, yes. too. Yes. I love power, power moves. moves. Okay. Yes. I got, listen, like I live for a good power move. Mm -hmm. What are they and, and how do we start? Is it like an architect? More, I need more. Yeah. Power okay. moves. So my favorite moves are the power moves. I'll go through some of my favorite ones, right? Okay, so in survive, there's the basics. Now the basics are not necessarily hard. They're not sexy. They're the basics. You've got to do them. And I label those the four C's, cash, cost, customers, communication, good cash flow, low fixed cost, strong moats around your customers, clearances, consistent communication, both external and internally. You're nodding. You know these things. Yeah. You build a tracker for those. Before the shock hits, you determine the metrics you're going to measure yourself in during a shock, right? So you've already made the decisions ex ante, right? Now, if yep. you do those things, you're going to get out of survive, but not well. And you're not setting yourself up to reset. you got to do the power moves. So one of my favorite power moves is the repurposing. So what happens is when there's a shock, you look at every single asset you have, physical assets, plant, equipment, buildings, digital assets, people assets, and ask one question. Can this asset add the same amount of value to the business now as it could before the shock? If not, who or what could it add value for? And we saw many examples of this in 2020 and 2021. You know, Formula One teams repurposing to make ventilators. You know, fast fashion companies in the UK repurpose their teams to grocery stores. But you can see it all the time. And as a company, when you're in the reset, before you make a big capital decision, stop and say, who's looking to repurpose our partner, right? The other one is learning velocity. During survive mode, companies tend to turn off the learning because you're so focused on metrics and just getting through things. This is the ultimate yeah. time to learn. There is no better time to learn than a downturn. Feedback loops are shorter. Customers are super honest about what really matters to them. Employees are super honest about what really matters to them. You know, downturns or times of uncertainty are the best times to learn. So you've got to be heads up about it and explicitly incorporate learning into your weekly huddles. Not what do we have to do? What are, what are we going to do? 
what do we learn this week? What do we need to learn this week? And employee mm-hmm. engagement also becomes critical during survive phase. You know, you get lazy about it sometimes, but that becomes a real strategic asset that you need to move forward. Now, one of my favorite power moves though, Liz, and I'll share with you is called a no regret move. And here's what a no regret move is. A no regret move says, even if we got our beliefs wrong, we would not regret making this move. So we could take a belief on, you know, when and how AI will touch something. We could make a belief around, you know, carbon regulation. And we're saying with a no regret move, hey, even if we got that belief wrong, we wouldn't regret making this move. And you should leave every strategy session saying, what no regret moves do we identify? Because then just start acting on them. Now, some things are not yeah. no regret moves. Those go into a different decision-making framework, but then you're giving some empowerment to teams because they're seeing action, even as you might still be in the early phases of survive and reset. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Sounds like the opposite awesome. of the sacred cow, right? I mean, yeah. it's, uh, no regret moves are that total opposite. One of the other things that you have in there that's actually very interesting is really uh, that notion of the right to win. What is the right yes. to win? A lot of companies forget that they have that. And and why is that? I mean, most companies forget that they have it. You know, a lot of things in strategy we've gotten lazy about, and for let's for lack of a better word, we've just gotten lazy about. And one of those is what's our competitive advantage or differentiation. And part of what we do, and you see this in pitch decks, you see this in established multi-billion dollar public companies. We say, hey, here's our choices. And here's how we're going to win there. And it ends up being generic, vague stuff about being customer centric or having great employees or kind of, you know, being really innovative. And guess what? Oh, all of your competitors are saying the same fluff. thing. It's all yeah, fluff. it's all fluff. It's, it's all fluff. Your right to win is what do you have that other organizations do not? What can you do that other organizations cannot? Or how can you build moats around your advantage? No one can take away. Now, those three questions sound super simple. That's a very short list of things that pass it. What do you have other companies do not? What can you do other companies cannot? How can you build moats around your advantage no one else can take away? If you force that conversation, the list will first be short, right? And second, you're going to identify some gaps. And now we know what we need to build into our strategy. We've got to start building something in order to have this right to win going forward. It's a modern mm, day master awesome. class. It's like sitting in a Ram Sharan red vest event. <laughs> I love it. I love it. it is, so you know, as we're as we're closing out here, and I know we're coming to the end, right? But I want to ask one last quick question. Please, yes. that, that like parting piece of advice. What are some of the biggest roadblocks that you kind of see leaders face as they're looking at this? Because while a lot of it sounds like, oh, I can yeah. come up with that mm-hmm. list. Oh, I can look at that. I mean, I can imagine that the hurdles that people then put in their way have got to be massive. So what are some of those Mm -hmm. when you're looking at that reset and moving into Thrive and and how do you advise people to get through that? Yeah, absolutely, Liz. Look, I really, a part of my my teaching, my advising is all about, I'm going to make this stuff simple. You know, everyone else is going to make it sound complicated so they sound smart. I'm going to make it sound simple because I want you to do it. Like, this is my passion, right? But that's because they're simple doesn't make them easy, right? And going through the Survive, Reset, Thrive loop is not easy. Now, one of the biggest things that happens if you're a true entrepreneur is I call it the, I've got this, you know. I've seen this before, you know, I got a company through 2001, you're both laughing, you know, some people who do this, I've got a company through 0809, I got a company through 2020, like, I am my best in downturns, right? Now, the problem is you put the same downturn playbook in place, and uncertainty is not a downturn, right? Uncertainty is giving you opportunities, and you're putting the wrong playbook in place because you think you've got this, right? Now, the second thing that I see is what I call the holding pattern. You know, you're in the meeting and you say, let's just wait. Let's just wait until we see if that regulation comes through. Let's just wait until after the elections. You know, half of the world's population is voting this year. Do you know how many companies are sitting on assets and capital and decisions until after November, right? And you're putting your company in this constant holding pattern, (laughs) right, where everyone else is kind of going through. And then the third is what I call, and there's about, there's many of them, we'll just go through three, is boredom, right? And what I mean is as an entrepreneur, now this is my specifically to our entrepreneurs listening, you get a company into Thrive and your adrenaline goes down because you miss the heightened pace of Survive. You miss the strategic stimulation of the reset. And now things are working and you go looking for stuff to do, right? Because that adrenaline is not there anymore. So those are probably yeah. companies, the three biggest things that I find, right? The I've got this, the holding awesome. pattern or the boredom. Yeah. Hire a good COO. I'm a special ops guy. If you put me in operations, <laughs> we'll all be in trouble. <laughs> 
<laughs> or, or yes, 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 yes. And know where the right place to put I'm right to put inside anything. your company. Yes, yes. He's not going to say anything. We are here with Dr. Rebecca Holmes, yes. author of SRT, Survive, Reset, and Thrive, Breakthrough Growth Strategies uh, in Volatile Times. It's a very important book. It's coming Amazing. out the 27th. We got a special yes. sneak preview. Get her so book on great. Amazon and follow her on X at Rebecca mm -hmm. Holmes. So thank you so much for being on the show. Congratulations no, thank on the Liz. release. Thank you, Ray. Oh, yeah. So good. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's keep the conversation Holmes. going. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Take care. Happy Friday. We'll see them in the green room, but oh my God. Woo. Wow. As your mind blown. That was a lot. I kind of, I kind of feel like I've got a really long, like emotional to-do list that I have to somehow roller coaster through now. Like, oh my gosh. It's going to be awesome, though. I love it. Thanks for having me, Ray. It's always so much fun. Oh. But I always seem to come and host Ravala when I've got a horrible voice. So I don't know what I know. this is. Thank you about that. <laughs> so, I don't know but, what's uh, going on here, everyone. Yeah. Well, hey, next week, episode number 354, we've got Dr. Parmajit Rami Chopra. He's the MD and CEO at Mimit Health. We've got Diner Osgo, CEO at Smart Care. And, of course, Kate Braverty author of Work Different, 10 Truths for Winning in the People Age. And of course, you can catch us here live. If it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV. Follow us on Twitter, YouTube, anywhere else that you have on a social media channel. And of course, right here on ConstellationArt.com. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for being on the show. Happy Friday, everyone. Of course, anytime. Bye, guys. See you guys in the green room. Oh.